Thank you all for showing up today. I'm going to talk a bit about my pet project called Tala. Um, it's going to take 30 to 40 minutes, and then there will be questions afterwards. Um, so the talk is going to be split into a couple of points. We're going to start with an introduction. Then we're going to talk a little bit about the C programming language that we all love. Um, then we're going to walk over a bit of the architecture behind Tala, some testing, and how we represent a very specific component of the software um, in Erlang. And then at the end, there's questions. If there's anything you want to sort of interrupt me with and ask a question during the talk, feel free to do so. Um, so Tala is an attempt to write a robust third-party implementation of Tor. Um, I decided to do it in Erlang because I really like Erlang. Is there anyone in here who's familiar with Erlang? Then you can raise a hand. Oh, wow, there's a lot of people. Cool, very cool. Um, so this is also a talk to create some enthusiasm for the project. So if you want to hack on it afterwards, come by to me and we can talk about that. Um, it was also, I, everyone who is here, I guess, knows something about Tor and knows like the EFF picture with, uh, with how Tor works. Does everyone know that picture? It's used quite a lot. Um, and I wanted to know a bit more deep how it works. So I wanted to try to implement, look at the specs, see how it works, see how, what are the problems with designing these things and so on. Um, it's also one of those typical evening-only open source projects where I have a little time every now and then, and if I have time to hack a bit on it, I do it, but other than that, it doesn't get too much attention because I also have a work to do. So a little bit of the history. It all started out at the Erlang User Conference in 2015. They take place each year in the summer, uh, where I met Linus from the Tor project. And he was very enthusiastic about doing a Tor implementation in Erlang, but didn't have much time to do so. So we sat back during one of the talks and talked about what would be required to do so and how far would we be able to get in, in what kind of time frame. So we started the development in August 2015. Um, we had a very simple proof of concept daemon up and running uh, a bit later that year. And we then went to a slightly more sensible design um, a couple of months after that. And a guy called Lasse also joined. Oi. Um, and Lasse has been working on it quite actively ever since and cleaning up some of the initial code and so on, getting it to work in a more stable manner. So right now we're two active people on the project and we're of course interested in finding more active people to the project. Um, there is the official Tor implementation in C and then there is a couple of other implementations as you can see here. I'm not going to go over any of them. They are. Um, specific to the languages. Some of them are further than others. Uh, Galois, which is like a, a company that does a lot of Haskell, they're pretty far with their implementation. They have a um, hidden service support, I think, up to that point, and then nothing else. Um, I think the subgraph people are the ones who started the Orkite project, which is the Java implementation, which is also pretty interesting. So these are the ones you could look at. Uh, the one that inspired me initially to do it in Erlang was the Go implementation, which uh, it actually managed to run on the production network and set some pretty, uh, with a very, very fast relay. So we set to figure out a minimal viable product to do here. Um, but due to Tor's end-to-end -end nature of the program, we really didn't want to implement a client because the client is where all the difficult logic is. It's the client that decides the circuit paths. It's the client that does all the crypto negotiations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we settled on doing a middle relay um, as the primary priority and as a secondary priority doing exit nodes. I guess, is everyone familiar with the differences between those two? Great. Um, onion services we're ignoring for now, except where we have to, and we want to use as few C dependencies as possible. That's also part of the goal because, like, we're going to talk about that a bit later. It was also Im important when we started the design that we did it so modular that we could go back and rewrite the core part of the system from scratch if we did something stupid, because there's a big chance we're going to do that. So when you do something like this, you have to be a bit careful with what we do. We cannot run these things that we experiment with on the production network. Um, there exist few test networks. I don't know if people are familiar with Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a very active test network, and it's well running, and there's nodes on it, and it's doing work. Tor has a small test network, which is only like internal people, and you have to get invited to it. Um, so we have to settle with some smaller test network that we run ourselves. I'm going to get back to that when we look at the, how we test the source code. 
Um, I also started an email thread in August about w what the Tor project saw as important aspect to think of when you start a project like this, because there might be other people doing it at some point. So there's already a lot of people in here who knows Erlang. Erlang is a functional programming language made by Ericsson in Sweden. Um, it focuses a lot on doing concurrency where we pass data around using messages. Some people might be familiar with that from other languages, but Erlang is based around this actor model where you design everything using different processes that communicate throughout message passing. It has one really neat feature. I don't know, the people who are doing Erlang probably knows them as binaries. It's a way to do pattern matching from functional languages on binary structures, which is really, really, really awesome. Um, it was the one feature who really sold me on Erlang initially. And it's very nice for working with network protocols because of that, both string-based protocols, but also like real binary protocols like Tor. It's running on this virtual machine called Beam, um, and it compiles to these bytecode, fi bytecode, uh, bytecode files that you load into the virtual machines. We're going to look a bit more at that. Um, you code using modules in Erlang, and modules consist of functions, like you expose a function interface from the module. Um, you tend to module your complex objects with state as processes, and processes then communicate uh, via message passing, as I said before. And we also use, when we have a lot of concurrent processes that is doing a lot of different work, they, we sort of need to have some ordering of some of the events in these systems. So we have processes taking care of sort of serializing the flow of data by sending a message to this process. Then it can only handle one message at a time, so the next message that comes after will have some kind of ordering in the system. The language has very, very good testing frameworks, very, very mature testing frameworks, and it has uh, very, very rich um, like mocking features where we can uh, change a function just for test and alter. It's like yeah, playing with Lego where we quickly can move things around when we do doing some kind of tests. And that's especially useful for cryptography stuff in the code. Um, so you have to have this special mentality when you're working with Erlang. You have to see it as you're writing an operating system, which is domain specific for your work. Um, your program, the way Erlang works is that you have a lot of modules which is included in applications and you then start the applications inside this domain specific operating system that you have built. So we have also a set of applications that consists of a set of modules that we're then running. Um, one of the really nice features of Erlang that many languages don't have is that you can hot load code. I thought that was nice for Tor because you know when you have a Tor relay and you need to restart it, you're gonna terminate every connection that is relaying through you. With this, unless there is a very, very critical bug, we would be able to keep the connections open while we upgrade the system. That's also a very, very nice property to have in a system. Any questions about this? No. We have a community, you're free to join our Tala IRC channel. It's on the same IRC network as the Bonn Hack Festival. Um, we have a, yeah, an IRC server and an Onion URL you can connect to um, for, for, for chatting. And all the developers are basically sitting in there. So, a little bit about C. So, it's hard to write complicated C code. We already know that. And I guess if we know that from history by now, we've seen it with a lot of projects each week having severe security issues. Um, the Tor daemon is a very, very high quality piece of C code in general. Um, it's considered that by quite a lot of people. We've seen that uh, the PVS Studio, is people familiar with this tool? It's a proprietary static code analyzer. And they went over the Tor source code recently and they couldn't find any bugs with it, which is quite well done. Uh, we also had that the, the, does people know what Coverity is, Coverity.com? It's also a static code analyzer. They also ran a lot of tests and they gave a lot of kudos in 2009 to Tor and a lot of other projects where we got rung three certification. I'm not fully sure what that means, but you can Google this report and find uh, the explicit summary of it. Um, Tor and C works pretty well. We have very high, I also work on C Tor, in, like for a living. Um, so. I do the Erlang thing in my spare time and C thing in my work time. Um, we have very high test coverage. That's one thing that's really, really good for us. So we detect things early because of the test. We have um, active team rotations in the core team of Tor. 
so that each week we have different tasks we need to deal with, like handling new bugs, handling user support, and one of them is handling coverity issues that comes in from static code analyzers running around. We recently joined the OSS FUS. Is people familiar with what that, what that is? It's Google who set up this fussing infrastructure where you can submit um, small programs that is executed on some uh, undefined big cluster at Google and is doing a lot of, uh, of fussing using AFL and libfuzzer, I believe. And of course, we have code review, uh, as all other mature projects. Everyone, all code that goes in has to be reviewed by someone. And we also have that Nick Mathewson is, at the end, reading all lines that enters tor.git. So there is like an extra safety net there in Nick. So some really interesting work that started happening at the last Tor developers meeting um, when we were in Amsterdam earlier this year was that there was a breakout session about third-party implementations. And uh, it was led by Chelsea. Um, there was a lot of discussions, mostly around a thing like Tala, which is an entire rewrite of Tor, but also by people who want to slowly change the C Tor into something else. And we are actively now working, or well, Sebastian and Chelsea and Isis are working on uh, integrating Rust into the C Tor project. There is Rust code already in the C Tor repository, and you can build Tor with Rust enabled. And I believe we use the Rust memory allocator a sort of a test for all of it. It's pretty cool and it seems to be that way we're moving right now. We are talking about new features at some point in the future it's going to be have to be written in Rust instead of C. So Tala and C. So I want to write something that has a little C as possible. Um, Beam is C by nature. Um, we use Libsodium for some cryptography. We use Libcrypto for, from OpenSSL or LibreSSL but we do not use libssl. Does people know what the difference between that is? So libssl is the TLS state machine and the TLS protocol, and libcrypto is just the crypto primitives. So we don't use, when there is issues with TLS in OpenSSL, we're not affected. Erlang has its own TLS state machine. We also had to use some small C functions for RSA key generation because that was not available to, from, for some reason in the Erlang VM. So I'm going to jump to a bit of the, how the architecture is in Tala. Was there any questions to any of these things? No. <coughs> cool. So we have one component called eNagle. Nagle is this small crypto library made by Daniel Bernstein and a couple of other people. eNagle is written by Jesper, who's uh, quite active in the Erlang community. It's a wrapper around Lipsodium, and we use it for x25519 Diffie-Hellman. And for it has access to DevU random. It has like a wrapper that is portable for different operating systems that we use for random uh, byte sequence generation. The source code is on GitHub under Jesper's URL. It's a pretty nice library. It's very well tested and pretty high quality. It's used a lot uh, by, by different online projects. Then we need to also use ED25519. It turns out that there's different versions of this signature scheme where they encode the signatures differently. Some hashes the public key into the final signature, and some doesn't. So we couldn't use ED25519 from X25519, uh, no, from uh, eNagle. So we had to take the implementation from Tor, lift out of the Tor repository, and make a small shim um, to interface with Erlang for it. And yawning was a great help for this, to find out that there is different versions of this signature scheme. I think it took me a weekend to figure out this. Then we have Luke. There is this uh, big fear in the crypto community right now that everything has to move to post-quantum uh, cryptography where we're secure against quantum computer attacks. There is some work by ISIS and uh, Peter Schwabe where they've made a specification for Tor to support this uh, New Hope handshake mixed with X25519 so that if New Hope turns out to be a problem, then we can still rely on the hash function that we believe is secure and X25519, which we believe is secure now as well. We haven't really integrated it yet because there is no code for the CTOR implementation right now to support this, so we're still sort of waiting a bit with how that is going to turn out for, for Tor itself. Yes? I'm, uh, I'm not familiar with uh, New Hope on what kind of uh, primitive system that is. Um, it's based on, oh, what's it called? Uh, ring learning with error. That's sort of the problem they're using uh, in, in the system. Okay. So it's like, it has the pretty big keys, but smaller than some of the other post-quantum. Post -quantum, uh, it's also important to address that Tor is trying to 
we don't try to prevent an active attacker who has right now a quantum computer because then we would need to change all the signature schemes as well. So it's only that we want to be sure that the data flowing in the network cannot be decrypted when someone in the future builds a quantum computer. That's two different attack scenarios. But this is mostly a for fun project that I added one evening, so there's nothing yet for from Tor about this. Then we have the most important library, it's just called Onion. It's a small Erlang application which binds all these other components together and exposes a nicely modular interface, which means that the big application which does all the state machine for the protocol has some utility library where there's not really many stateful functions, which we can just use as API for wrapping out to different providers. Everything we do, we generally try to generalize it and lift it into the Onion library and then we add, make sure that there's tests for all the code in there. So that is like the most important and most stable part of the project right now. It's like the standard library for building Tor-related applications in Erlang. Then there's Tala itself. Um, if you're familiar a bit with Tor, there's like a directory component where there's something where we work with this system where you announce your relays and clients use it to figure out which relays exist and they're voting about it. And then we have an actual Onion protocol where we connect through the networks using this, using the Onion protocol. And then we have some kind of core, which is abstraction. It's um, information about uptime of the relay and stuff like that. Things that just needs to be generalized but are still somewhat stateful. The Onion routing component and the directory component have sort of a circular dependency to each other, which is really nasty that we're trying to figure out how we deal with somehow. Um, that means the code is a bit more icky than it's supposed to be, but we have some kind of idea how to abstract it out right now by, of course, adding one extra layer of abstraction. <laughs> this is pretty much how it looks. We used to not have RSA. Uh, no, we, we used to need a C shim in the Onion library for uh, key generation of RSA. That has been moved into OTP, like in the Erlang releases, so we don't have that need anymore for, from OTP uh, 20, which was released in June earlier this year. But this is generally the whole, all the dependencies, all the applications that we have running in the Erlang VM. Of course, ignoring all the things that comes from the Erlang standard library. Testing, was there any question to any of this before? No. Can people see this? Yeah, ish. Okay, cool. We have like classical unit testing and um, the Tor source code itself comes with a lot of tests that is very nice when you're working with this because you can just copy out some of the test vectors and play around with it and make sure that your code works. This is generally taken from uh, the CTOR uh, implementation. But for some of the components that are standardized, we also add um, like test vectors from the RFCs that we then include into the source code so that we just build up some trust in the code that we're trying to, to build up. We also use something called property-based tests, where we try to generalize our tests into um, testing properties instead of testing direct values. We have two kind of people familiar with property-based testing? Is someone? Yeah, of course, the Erlang people are properly <laughs> um, You have a concept called a generator, which generally is a way to generate a random value of a specific type. And then you have a shrinker attached to the generator which can shrink towards some zero value. So for a list type, it would be going towards the empty list. For an integer value, it would be going towards zero, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> we use a free implementation of this. There is a really, really good proprietary quick check implementation by a Swedish company which costs like 5,000 euro a year. Um, so we cannot use that because nobody can afford that. Um, and right now we mostly use it for stateless testing. With QuickCheck you can do some really neat stateful testing where you start testing protocols. We plan on using that, but for now it's only the stateless stuff we're using. So, a simple example of that. Um, I'm gonna go a bit away from here. We have a base64 module, which has an encoder, which takes a binary data and returns some binary data. That's how, like, the signature of the encoder. The decoder is a bit different. It takes some encoded data, which is some binary data, and returns a tuple, which is either OK and decoded, or error and a reason. So the, de the decoder can fail. Then we have a validate function, which just takes and some encoded data and tells us whether the it's base64 encoded, or we can assume that it's base64 encoded. This we can generalize into a property. So we say we encode, we have some data, 
which is a random binary sequence. We say we encode this random binary sequence into the encoded data. We then check with the, our validator that the data that we generate is valid to ourselves. It would be pretty stupid that we generate data that we cannot validate. And then we say that if we decode the encoded data, then we get a decoded variable. And then at the end, we say that data should be equal to the decoded value. Does people get this? So it's sort of we're testing the isomorphy between these two things. This is a pretty simple example. Um, the build tool for Erlang then generates a set of tests. You can have it run all night, or you can just have it run for 100 tests. And it will try to find some errors. If there's no errors, everything is good. And we try to run this for everything we do. A slightly more complicated example, we have uh, Diffie-Hellman, classic Diffie-Hellman. It's used um, mostly for the legacy hidden services right now. Um, where we have a generator, which is a two in this case, and we have some prime number. Then we have a function to generate a key pair, a secret key, and a public key. We can generate a shared secret from someone else's public key and our secret key. We can check if the um, public key we received is degenerate. It has some specific specifications, uh, no, some specific properties we want to test for there, which is also defined in TOR's specifications. And we have some parameters. We make the parameters a function that returns a list of two elements, just R, P, and G. This is so that we can mock it later. We can change the generator and we can change the prime number. We then create a simple generator. Because we're using real random data here, we just generate the key pair using whatever OpenSSL is doing to generate it. We can then say for all uh, A secret and A public, B secret and B public, they are both key pairs we've just generated. If we compute this shared secret between A, S, and BP, and B, S, and AP, we want to be sure that they're the same. This is sort of the property of Diffie-Hellman that we get the shared secret if we exchange public keys. This is a pretty simple test to do. This is a bit more complicated. We have to test for these G generate values. Um, so we still have the RG and P. This is the same module. We have the is generate, uh, is degenerate value. We now have a set of things that we know is bad values when you have Diffie-Hellman. So we know that all the negative numbers are bad. We know that the integers 0 and 1 are bad. We know that using the generator itself is bad. And we know that every value from p minus 1 to infinity are bad values. So now we can define a test down here that says, for all pu bad public keys that we've generated with the bad public key generator, the onion, the isGenerate function should return true. Now we can generate a lot of bad keys that we can then test. And again, we also test that the keys that we generate are not degenerate. That would be pretty bad. Does people get that? Cool. It seems like it. For network testing, we use Chutney. It's a pretty nice little tool that is provided by Tor. You write these Python files that where you say how many of a certain type of Tor instance you want to be running. And then you say how many of them you want to run. And then you run those pretty uh, few steps to configure your network, to start it, to check the status of every node if they're still running. And you can stop it again. So you can quickly spawn up a big Tor network of 200 nodes and have it run on your laptop with directory authorities, middle relays, clients, exit nodes, everything. It's a very, very nice tool to use. Yes? It is designed for Tor, uh, but basically it takes a binary and just starts the binary many times with some configuration files from a template. It's a very generic tool, but it's like the code that ships with it is, is designed for Tor. Yeah, you can integrate your own stuff into it. So I integrate Tala into Chutney. So I spawn a big network of ordinary CTOR demons, and then I run a few Tala demons in it. So that is possible. This is like the most important component of the Tala application. We have a peer process, which represents a node in the network, an active node that we're connected to. Because the network can block when we send messages, we also have to have a small satellite process that are sort of connected to it, which has the queue of cells that we're sending. This is where we sort of serialize the data that we're sending out to this node. 
what we then do is that we have a number of circuits that we build up that we make out. So these are also individual processes. This means now that the circuit encryption that is happening is happening in their own processes. This means that they are isolated. We can terminate one of them if we have an error, and it won't affect the other ones. When we build connectivity to another node in the network, because we're only a middle node, we never make clients. That means that we always have a connection coming in which wants to connect to someone on the outside. This means that we have a representation of both of them, and we have a manager which sort of takes care of all the input and output of it and make sure that if one of them disconnects, the other one is notified, et cetera, et cetera. Right now, we have one circuit process represented for each of the peer, which is stupid because they have the same state. So we're moving towards a network design which is more like this. So we have states, uh, circuits that are mutually owned by the two processes. There are some resources to look at. We have um, at the Tor specifications. There's the Tor spec and the directory spec. Those are needed. You have to read all of them to understand the Tala code. There is some really good Erlang resources if you want to get introduced to Erlang. Um, and there is, of course, the C Tor code, which is really, really easy to also dive into uh, and get some kind of understanding of what's going on and extracting test cases and so on when you're building stuff. The source code itself for Tala is available. I would really like that you don't run it on the production network. That's sort of the whole carefulness thing. Run it and test if you want to play around with it. Um, and feel free to submit uh, issues and patches if you want to work on it. So some of the conclusions that I found out when I started this project, and especially after I've started working on the C implementation, is that it's really, really difficult to write a third-party implementation of Tor. Um, the specs are really good. There's really good tests. But there's a lot of things in the source code that is not in the specifications because there is such a big research community and security people who are looking at Tor constantly and things are evolving very fast. This makes it difficult to make a very safe implementation. It was a really good way for me to get a very deep understanding of how Tor works, which was one of the things I really wanted to, to learn initially. Um, we're at the point where we can relay traffic as a middle node. We want to do exit node during this year at some point. And we can run it on a small test network for ourselves, and that seems to be working pretty well. Is there any questions? We are at the end. Yes? Uh, you noticed on your last, uh, or you noticed on your last slides that um, it's really difficult to write a, uh, a safe implementation because yes. there's some parts in the source codes uh, that aren't really in the specification, yes. if I understand correctly. Yes. Um, now that you've written, um, do you personally see that as a problem or a weakness uh, of Tor that they don't? Because I can imagine if uh, the protocol isn't really thoroughly uh, standardized or not really completely on paper, that when researchers analyze uh, how Tor works, they have the wrong picture of the <coughs> protocol and then uh, issues can arise uh, yes. due to, uh, well, basically implementation errors or source code errors yes. uh, that don't appear to exist in the protocol level. I mean, I think that one of the problems is the specifications will always be a bit behind of state-of-the-art research. Because the research comes out, they release papers, um, we analyze the papers, we find some issues, and then we have to go back and fix the specifications. That's more the problem that you would have to... I think I would have to read more text than I want to read to understand all the things that are encoded in each line in the CTOR implementation. That's sort of the scary thing. Reading these specs is very easy. That was what I wanted initially. My mental image was that I should be able to sit down, read these text files, and be able to implement it. That's sort of a pretty sensible goal, I think. But when it came to that, I started looking into the C source code. There's a lot of things there with like timing and how it schedules, how things are coming out, and stuff like that that are important to keep uh, equal to the, to the C implementation. Yes? No, um, the Go implement. Oh, I actually think the Java implementation might have some client nodes, um, but of the middle nodes, I think the Go implementation, written by Tom, he he wrote it and ran it, and I think it broke some records in how much traffic it was actually running through. He faced a problem with a memory leak between Go's uh, copying between stacks from how Go is to the C code of OpenSSL. Um, that I know has been running on the production network, but it's not running there anymore. He sort of left the project. Um, 
yes. Uh, are there any specific reasons uh, why you haven't chosen Elixir? Uh, very good question. Uh, for people who are not familiar with it, Erlang is sort of uh, an old uh, functional language, and Elixir is a more modern, um, it's a bit Ruby-like. I don't know if it's bad to call it that. It's a more fancy version, and it's running on the same virtual machine. There is no reason other than I know Erlang. Um, I think we would welcome Elixir components in it. Uh, we, we use Reba 3 as build tool, so you would be able to use it. Um, but I, I just don't know. I actually think I like some of these things from Elixir, but I'm just more familiar with our okay. Cool. Other questions? If you want to, you can come by our village. Oh. If you want to, you can come by our village and chat a bit about it if you're interested. Cool. Thank you.